Welcome to Ancestral Health Today, evolutionary insights into modern health. Hi, everyone, and thank you for being on the Ancestral Health Podcast today. Uh, we are honored to have Ali Houston today with us. Ali, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Thank you, Isabel. I'm well, thank you. Yeah, really happy to be here. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being with us. Ali, can you let our audience know um, about you, who you are, have you gotten into the space, and um, anything else that may be relevant? Yeah. So I used to be a physicist whose mental health was terrible, and now I'm a metabolic mental health coach whose mental health is much, much better. Thankfully, I had um, chronic anxiety, seasonal depression, and really bad kind of ADHD symptoms since I was a kid. And I, I got to the stage where, um, you know, I had other metab metabolic problems into my 20s, struggling with my weight, which was a big driver to try to improve my health. But um, ended up getting a physics degree and working in industry for a few years and starting a PhD in gravitational wave physics at the University of Glasgow. And kind of got lucky because my physics professor, Ken Strain, had a few years before um, been diagnosed with ME-CFS and been told he probably wouldn't ever work again. And he was devastated. He was in his early 40s, um, really in the prime of his career, trying to find gravitational waves. And he did a bit of his own research, discovered Gary Taubes, Good Calories, Bad Calories is the, the name in the UK of, the, of his book, and tried a ketogenic diet. And within six months, he was running 10Ks again, having been bedridden. So he, he was amazed and went back to work um, trying to find gravitational waves, which they did in 2014. But developed this really deep side interest in researching the human body and why what he did had helped him so much. You know, he'd, he'd taken some supplements as well and, and learned a lot of things along the way around the damage that can be caused by grains and by modern fats that are uh, not necessarily well suited to human uh, anatomy and various other things. So he would say things like, wheat isn't food and nobody should be eating margarine and five a day was just invented by uh, marketing people and I thought well, what is he talking about and then when I quizzed them a bit more I realized he'd made this mir almost miraculous recovery from MECFS and he was able to see that compared to my previous work history and uh, de undergraduate degree result, I was really massively underperforming. My brain fog was worse than it had ever been. So my ADHD symptoms were off the charts. Um, I was seriously depressed during the winters um, and my anxiety was, was terrible and I still couldn't control my weight. And he didn't tell me what to do. He just said, look, here's some places you can look. So I went away red for hundreds of hours and I'm got more and more convinced that, you know, eating in a you know, ketogenic way, maybe even a carnivore way could be extremely powerful in um, affecting your metabolism and your mental health and ultimately controlling your weight. That was what I was most convinced about at first. So I thought, okay, I'll give it a go. And I decided to try a kind of, um, pretty extreme version of a ketogenic diet that was being talked about by Peter Dobromilski, who wrote the amazing blog Hyperlipid. And it was really the uh, ghee, lots and lots of egg yolks, and some cream that I would mix with the egg yolks and some sweetener, some erythritol to make a, a sort of uh, ice cream. And within days, I felt much, much better. My gut problems started to clear up. I was sleeping better. I used to have terrible heartburn all the time. That went away completely. I could sleep lying down instead of half sitting up. Were you just eating that during that time? For a time, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I felt like it was a clean elimination diet. Mm -hmm. And I was convinced by the work of Georgia Ede by that point as well that an elimination diet is 
really the gold standard in seeing if there's any interaction between um, your your food environment and your health. Because yeah, there are tests you can do, but they're expensive, inconclusive, and the only way you ultimately find out is to try cutting things out. So I didn't realize that dairy could be such a problem for me. And in the end, I did cut out dairy. I don't really eat it these days. But at the time, I thought, well, there's not much dairy protein in ghee and cream, so I'll give it a go. And that would be a fairly clean elimination diet. I felt absolutely incredible mentally. And that was the most profound change for me. I mean, yes, the extra weight melted off and uh, and stayed off, which was which was great. But, you know, like others have said, sometimes you come for the, the weight loss and you stay for the mental health benefits. Now, the year before, in 2015, I'd been formally diagnosed with ADHD, which made a sense of a lot of my symptoms kind of growing up. And I'd been on Ritalin for that year. At first, it had helped with focus, but then I needed to take more to get the same effect. I started to get nasty side effects, like kind of emotional numbness and um, irritability and anger. So I didn't like them. And... Um, when I uh, changed my diet and felt so much better, I came off the, the Ritalin and felt fine. My focus was good. My mood was high and even. My anxiety wasn't there and my weight was under control. And always at the end of the summer, I would get worried thinking, okay, here comes the freight train of seasonal depression. And 2016 was the first year since I was a kid that I didn't get depressed in the winter. And it was just amazing. It was like... It was like having my brain back. And the only person who was really making sense of this at the time that I could find was Dr. Georgia Eid and her brilliant blog about how uh, food can affect mental health. So at the time, I, I decided that if I could go through this transformation, then I could help others to do the same thing. And in fact, I felt like a kind of duty to do that and to understand why it might have helped because it's one thing accepting that a clinical outcome is probably due to an intervention. But it's another thing, at really understanding the causes, because when you do, then you can do the much more powerful thing, which is help people who haven't been helped by a common or garden ketogenic diet. So I set about doing that. I read a lot about the MECFS community because they're very knowledgeable. They have to be because of the neglect that they face. Um, and so there's all this amazing information on Phoenix Rising and um, Sarah Myhill community and various other communities. Before we go into that detail, were you diagnosed with an autoimmune condition in addition to um, the depression and the ADHD? So I was diagnosed with sarcoidosis, which okay. is sometimes disputed as a direct autoimmune okay. condition. Um, some people call it kind of autoimmune adjacent and uh, I had that in my lungs and on my skin and um, I also have achalasia of the cardia where my food pipe closed up when I was eight years old and I lost lots of weight I had to get um, I had to get a balloon dilation twice under anesthetic which allowed me to eat fairly normally and it's thought that that might be autoimmune in nature um, certainly members of my family have direct autoimmune um, diagnoses, including alopecia, uh, hypothyroid, Hashimoto's hypothyroid, um, childhood arthritis, these, mm. these types of things. So my family is like an autoimmune bomb site mm. and I've got some of the shrapnel for sure. Um, I mean, I had testicular cancer when I was 20, so it might be that is partially autoimmune in nature, you know. I think what's so powerful about the MECFS stuff is that I see it as a kind of umbrella for almost everything that can go wrong in the human body because mm -hmm. it's so well investigated. But as I say, in 2016, there was no joined up thinking in this regard. It was really still very much siloed. And even the sort of early work of people like David Unwin looking into uh, diabetes remission using diet was still seen as really fringe mm. and so I just plugged away I started selling paleo and keto food and um, 
start started a podcast and tried to educate people and 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 sort of informally help people. And then around about 2019, I thought, well, maybe I could formalize this and started to look at coaching options to kind of get a qualification in what I was doing already and ended up doing a qualification with a company called Precure, which had brilliant training. It's uh, based in New Zealand, Sam uh, Grant and Louise Schofield, and they're, you know, extremely experienced in public health. They, they know the benefits of diet and a holistic approach. And uh, really enjoyed that training and started to coach people professionally. And then around 2022, the Bazuki group uh, appeared and their son, Matt, has uh, been three years now with no bipolar disorder symptoms, having used the principles of metabolic psychiatry, which include using a ketogenic diet. And the time they set up the foundation, it had been more than a year that he'd been without symptoms. This is in the context of his absolutely terrible bipolar disorder, where he would run away from home during his um, periods of mania, um, you know, thinking he had magic powers and they, he would lose, they would lose contact with him. They didn't know where he was. It was incredibly scary. And then when he was at home, he was extremely depressed, suicidally depressed. So that had been going on for, for some years. And they met Chris Palmer eventually, having tried everything, it seemed, mm-hmm. all sorts of different drug combinations and, um, you know, different technologies that they thought might help and nothing had. And Chris Palmer suggested using a ketogenic diet. And here he is more than three years later. So um, people who don't know, David Bazuki co-founded Roblox, which is a global gaming platform and is uh, very successful. So they're very well resourced. So they wanted to put philanthropic money into the space and started to fund research into ketogenic diets of why did this help their son so much? And David and Jan, his wife, uh, run the Bazuki Group and announced prizes in 2022 for people who'd really been foundational in using ketogenic diets and metabolic psychiatry for mental health, which included Dr. Georgia Eid and various other people who'd been pushing it forward over the last few years. So that really lit a fire under everyone. And Mm -hmm. myself and my MetSci business co-founder, Dr. Rachel Brown, decided it would be a good time to try to coach people using the principles of metabolic psychiatry. And and that's where MetSci is right now. That's wonderful. That's a great story. Um, Tell us a little bit about what were the things that you had tried prior to 2016 in addition to Ritalin? And how did that compare to the changes that you saw after you found the ketogenic diet? Great question. Well, I think a lot of people end up self-medicating. And I think I'd found a form of stimulation like Ritalin in uh, caffeine, for sure. Mm -hmm. And I used to be an absolute caffeine fiend. These days, I, I tend to stick just to tea. I can't trust myself with coffee. I take it too far. But I maybe have like two cups of tea a day in the morning. And in those days, I might have five, six, seven, eight really strong cups of coffee, double espresso kind of strength. And it would keep me going. But again, like the Ritalin, I developed some kind of tolerance. I started to notice side effects. And in the end, I had to quit for a time. And then I'd start again because I wanted those benefits back. Afterwards, I think the focus benefits from a ketogenic diet were very apparent because I wasn't getting distracted in the same way. I was able to keep my focus and have a clarity of thought that otherwise I would need to really pump stimulants into me to feel. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have also been able to experiment with exogenous ketones to see if they have an independent effect. And I believe they do. Because if I take exogenous ketones, then my clarity of thought, my kind of articulate, um, articulacy and um, my uh, you know ability to focus are markedly better, even over and above a normal ketogenic state. So quite interesting that I also, um, I also tried various sort of 
valerian methods for depression like 5-HTP, um, valerian, uh, it was more for anxiety really, um, things like meditation and uh, exercise and all of them were very helpful and I think they can't, there is a role for drugs and supplements and uh, lifestyle interventions like exercise and um, meditation. Meditation was a very interesting one because it made me realize that my thoughts were not me. That I could choose whether to listen to them or not. So I, I came to view my thoughts as like fish swimming up to me and I could pick them out of the water and have a proper look at them and then decide whether I wanted to keep them for dinner or throw them back. But the great thing about my thoughts since I went on a ketogenic diet is that I just don't get the horrible fish anymore. So mm. it's not so much of a problem. I don't need to I don't need to slow down in that same way to catch myself feeling anxious and examine the thoughts because they just don't come. And it was another curious thing about, you know, past traumatic experiences, things that I really needed to work through. I was much more able to do it uh, after starting a ketogenic diet. And this is something that comes up again and again with clients is, you know, it's not the stress you're put under, it's the strain that you feel. Mm -hmm. And you're always going to get stresses. And the, the way that um, one patient of Georgia Eads described it was, before she started a ketogenic diet, her trauma was kind of in front of her face, like it was a hand in front of her face at all times. And then when she started a ketogenic diet, it was like there, but at arm's length, so she could deal with it. And this comes up again and again where clients of mine feel much better and then they spontaneously want to go to therapy to untie that knot. And it's not like therapy has been in the past and in a way how it was for me before where I changed my diet, which was that it felt something like picking at a wound or opening a wound. Um, not necessarily healing it sometimes, but oftentimes it just felt like you were running over the same ground. Whereas therapy after ketogenic uh, diet, it was like you could resolve stuff and move on. And this is something that I've seen again and again with clients and with uh, other people in the space. It's quite amazing. So I had tried lots of stuff. Um, I mean, for the weight, the, the thing that you hear all the time from doctors and nutritionists and dietitians and uh, people in authority is you just need to eat less and move more. And so I tried that several times thinking, and this is something coming from a physics background, you get a lot from physicists is it's calories in, calories out. You know, you can't cheat the laws of thermodynamics. But what they're not taking into account is that the body is a complicated hormonal system and that the calories out part of the equation is not simply determined by how much exercise you do and some chart that says if you weigh this much, this is how many calories you'll expend. You know, it's very clear from the work of Herman Ponser and others that it doesn't matter whether whether you're a hunter-gatherer in Tanzania walking for 12 hours a day or someone who's sitting at their desk in an office in Scranton, Pennsylvania, you're going to be burning the same amount of calories within a few percent purely based on your um, your lean mass. So it's really about working out what calories in will rev up the calories out. And this is something that, that I and loads of my clients have noticed is that they can sometimes be eating 3,000 calories a day and lose weight or change body composition, but look much better because they're revving up their metabolism. So yeah, it is calories in, calories out. But the calories they're putting in are increasing the calories out. They're spontaneously feeling like exercising. They feel warmer, both in terms of temperature and mood, if you like. The brain has more energy. So I tried starving myself with uh, eating lower calorie. And yeah, I got thin, but then hunger won. And I would just start eating again. And I would put on all the weight, plus a little bit more because I'd convinced my leptin, my fat cells, um, 
wherever the, the loop is with the hypothalamus that I had been starving and that I needed to put on a bit of more uh, fat to protect myself. So after a ketogenic diet, yeah, I've had a kind of ups and downs with weight um, a couple of times, but basically it's been smooth sailing. Yeah, the, the myth of calories in and calories out is so pervasive in the way that it is understood. I wish that everybody, you know, would take a closer look at the research, the um, the nature of, you know, human metabolism and how it just doesn't operate in that way, especially in the context of our modern diets. Um, so really great bringing that research to the forefront. Um so going from a physicist to what you're doing now, what were the early um, science and research um, understandings that drove you to have such a drastic change in, in your career? Well, first of all, it was like a Damascene moment where I myself turned my health around. And I think there's so many practitioners in the space, whether they're doctors, nurses, coaches, people who used to be lawyers or whatever it is, and they've had that themselves and sort of feeling is believing. It's really hard to explain improvements in mental health. You can tell someone, but they might not believe you. In fact, I know that people don't believe me a lot of the time because how could that be the case? Everyone would know about it if it worked. And also, um, it's really hard to just explain what that feeling is like so i've had clients who talk about it like finding a state of grace or the clouds parting and the sun shining through you really need this almost religious spiritual metaphorical language to convey the change in perception that i went through so that would have been enough to be honest even if the science didn't exist at all. But what I found when I when I dug was that there was this kind of interesting juxtaposition between clinical practice findings and academic research findings. You know, academic research moves much, much slower because yeah. clinical practitioners have much more leeway to try things off-label, um, especially if you're not a doctor and you're kind of a, a functional medic or a um, some other holistic practitioner, you can encourage clients to experiment by telling that this or that thing has worked for other people in a similar situation. And I think discounting those anecdotes because they're here and there is um, an abuse of the pyramid of evidence. If you have a situation where nobody ever gets better right and someone gets better just because it's an anecdote it doesn't mean it's worthless that is heavily weighted towards investigation because those that person was um, someone who doesn't get better a anywhere else so we mustn't dismiss those uh, apparent black swans to our theories and what i was doing was Consuming as much patient data from um, either forums where people were self-responding or from clinicians who were involved in MECFS, diabetes, mental health, any of these areas, and, um, and then comparing it with the existing literature. So I was most amazed at first by individual stories. You know, Zero Carb Zen was one of the places I looked first where people were getting better from all sorts of apparently different diseases by going zero carb and eating carnivore and and then <clears throat> the kind of connective tissue between these two kind of legs of uh, uh, clinical practice and academic work were people like Georgia Ede and Peter Dobromilski and um, you know Emily Deans I read a lot of at first people who were uh blogging about it whilst sort of trying to connect the the academic and the and the clinical and Gary, Gary Taubes as well there's there's a lot of evidence out there most of it at the time 
was mechanistic speculation. So taking the the amazing clinical data and saying we we accept that it was probably this intervention that worked. Now can we explain post facto why it worked? Here's half a dozen plausible explanations. And to be honest, that is pretty much still where we are with ketogenic diets for mental health. And there's nothing wrong with that if um if clinicians are adopting it and it works. But we still mm-hmm. want to know the next step of exactly why it works because as I said, then you can start to really understand why it's not helping some people and and set about helping them. And the main kind of um opposition you get to all of this is that oh well, if they got better then they, they can't have had the disease in the first place. There's this sort of no true Scotsman fallacy. And um Obviously, that's not true in all these cases. And so I think different different ailments have different levels of academic research behind them. I'd say that to diabetes is, is now very robustly understood um, in comparison to, say, cancer or a lot of the mental health. And with, with complicated systems like the human body, right, we can have the same presentation of a disease without necessarily the same triggers, right? So that makes it even more complicated. Absolutely. You know, one of my favorite researchers, Alessio Fasano, is big looking at gluten and it, and its problems with gut health and the connections with neurological and psychiatric illness. And of course, there's no real difference between a neurological neuron and a psychiatric neuron. And so we're kind of talking about the same thing there. And so... You know, he talks about how schizophrenia should really be called schizophrenias because it's an umbrella term. It's not one it's not one disease with one root cause. And there's a subset that is directly caused by gluten consumption. And people can hardly believe that, that, you know, such an everyday substance as bread is responsible for wrecking the lives of millions of people. And of course, it's absolutely un- incontrovertible and stuff and it's already established in the literature so absolutely and once you break it down you know i think it it's hard for scientists to admit that we don't really know a lot of this we're just kind of illuminating a very small part of the chessboard yeah one of the things i'm really excited about is seeing the reason connections that have been made because long covid patients develop um, you know, psychiatric problems that they didn't have prior to long COVID. And the research with neuroinflammation, I think, is shedding a lot of light um, in that regard. Um, any emerging research that you're excited um, that has come out lately or that you have been diving into? Yeah, well, I mean, actually, I think a lot of the long COVID MECFS stuff around gut health and, um, you know, microglial activation um, and this sort of neurological, infl- systemic neurological inflammation is so fascinating. And I've come to think that when you look at epilepsy, for which ketogenic diets have been used for more than a century now successfully, it used to be the only treatment available. And um it's kind of a miraculous cure for about a third of people, right? Mm. They, just, they, they stop more or less stop having seizures. Then for another third, it seems to do something, but not as much as they would want. And then for maybe a third or so, these are all rough numbers, a third or so people just don't seem to get the benefit. So yeah, it could be that epilepsy is several different diseases, which uh, have different root causes and, and some of which might not respond to a ketogenic diet. Or it could be that the root cause isn't, say, a deficiency in ketones. It's more like something deeper, which a ketogenic diet can help, but doesn't always Mm -hmm. um, in and of itself. And that is my pet theory. Based on all the stuff coming out about gut integrity, neuroinflammation, and um, microglial activation, and the damage that things like lipopolysaccharide can do. Mm-hmm. So 
what has this got to do with ketogenic diets and mental health? Well, I think that there's a clear signal in the clinical data that some people who do not succeed in improving their mental health with a ketogenic diet alone do with a carnivore diet. What is that about? Because the, the nutrient profile is probably going to be quite similar. You know, yeah, they replace some of their, um, their calories with plants. But if you're talking about low-carb vegetables, then it won't be much of the calorie content. And it's a very um, interesting difference, that. So my guess is that if someone has gut dysbiosis, or even more broadly, microbiome dysbiosis, which could be any microbiome, you know, in the, the sinuses, um, the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine, the, the biomes that we have inside our lymphatic system and, you know, different tissues around the body. If they get out of whack, then a ketogenic diet can go a long way to starving pathogenic microbes. Okay, great. So some people are just going to starve out what they need take uh they're going to have a, a, a more um, nutritious diet because animal foods are much higher in nutrition they will be running on ketones and fatty acids which the body is extremely attuned to doing especially if you're already insulin resistant which quite often happens with people with chronic illness so ketogenic diets tick all these boxes great but it might not go far enough in starving the pathogenic microbes that are causing this problem and Therefore, a ketogenic diet, which removes all fiber and starch altogether, will go further in starving pathogenic microbes. I think that is probably the difference between carnivore and keto and why we see this clinically. But um, what if that doesn't work? Or what if you want to go back to eating veggies one day? Or what if you are worried that there's something underlying that's still there that you want to be more aggressive about and see if you can get rid of it because it still might be causing underlying issues just because you feel better it doesn't mean you're optimal and you might still be running uh, with pathogens that are causing issues so i'm more interested now in um, how you can disrupt biofilms around the body and kill pathogens that might be there and safely flush them from your body and then i think you get more towards the kind of Garden of Eden, state of grace, uh, you know, um, position that all those people that Weston Price saw were in, where they were eating this massive variety of diets from zero carb all the way up to kind of 95% carbs. And they were all in the picture of good health. But they didn't have um, cesarean births and they weren't bottle fed. And I'm not judging and understand why it happens, just they weren't. And they didn't have rounds and rounds of antibiotics throughout their childhood and, and adulthood. Again, they can be life-saving, but of course they decimate the microbiome and what comes back in its place is anyone's guess. Um, they, didn't, they weren't exposed to the modern food environment. All, all these things which wreck gut health. So yeah, keto and carnivore might starve a lot of these pathogens, but they don't necessarily stamp them out and, and, and kill them and replace them properly. So that's the kind of area that I'm interested in, sparked in no small part by remission biome. This amazing clinical finding that people were having remission events, which are incredibly rare, almost non-existent, mm -hmm. and some cases going from bedridden to skipping down the street. You have to listen to that. And it's such a huge signal in terms of what's come before it. So... That's where I am with the kind of cutting edge of things. Yeah, the nuance that needs to go into, right, is whether it is a remission event or improvements and different aspects of health that people experience and how there's regression or it can be uh, necessarily duplicated in some people. There are so many reasons and so much that needs to be investigated. Um, but I find that so many people stop at, well, that didn't work for me or it worked for a little bit. And then, you know, I didn't see any benefit and, and there's so much more depth 
that we can go into uh, to peel out the layers of what happens during those instances, right? Um, what are you hoping to see in this field in the next five, 10 years? Where do you think that we are going? And, and maybe caveat that with the reality of, you know, our modern food system and our society in general, because there are so many factors in our um, society and our lifestyles that, you know, contradict our biological needs. And we have to face the reality that this is the world that we live in, right? Um, living this world only happens one way. Uh, but where do you see the contrast between the two, where we're going and how we can mitigate based on where we are? Yeah, great questions. Um, I want to see more joined up thinking. And I think it's unlikely to happen in the way I want because everyone has to get their head around something to fund it. So whether that's giving to a crowdfunding campaign or uh, an, an, uh, a public health body funding something through a specific funding call where the call is very narrow for the, the subjects that they'll fund, or a philanthropist who really cares about a specific issue and um, that only wants to fund that, understandably. You know, um, I think if you could define the problem how we are trying to define it in that very broad, deep sense, then I think you would get further by starting off with that joined up approach. So I would love to see that happen, but I certainly what is happening is there's more money going into metabolic mental health research, which is great. And I think the clinical signal is going to show up more in uh, in the academic studies and that that'll just result in more academic study. I was a little bit skeptical that there would be any public money going into it. But then with the bazooki funded research in Stanford and in Edinburgh and elsewhere around the world, that's now um, kind of been rolled into the UK to a 22 and a half million pound UKRI, which is the, the public funding body, one of the public funding bodies, um, grant for five research hubs for mental health in the UK, two of which are for metabolic mental health. So one of them is in Edinburgh, one of them is in Cambridge, both top, top universities getting public money to investigate ketogenic diets for mental health. Amazing. And it is. I think... I think that is um, a very interesting change in the wind direction, and one I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm very uh, wel I'm very welcoming to. And of course, um, I've won some money from the Bazooki Group. They very kindly uh, offered to match the crowdfunding we're doing for uh, the Oxford study next year in ketogenic diet for ADHD with depression, which is obviously very close to my heart, and I'll be running the study there. So. There's stuff happening, and it means that we can roll it into bigger, um, bigger research. There's a six million. There's been a six million dollar gift from Bazookis to research bipolar disorder. It's amazing, and it'd be great to see multi-center randomized controlled trials happen in the next five years. I think that's ultimately what everyone wants to see, and I think as the funding improves, the granularity of the data improves, and you can um, find out more. So depends on which measurements are important and um, we don't quite know exactly what they are yet. We have mitochondrial researchers looking for smoking guns in terms of biomarkers and mm -hmm. I know that Remission Biome is excited about some there. I'm very interested in lactate and pyruvate and um, I know other researchers um, are looking at kind of dopaminergic uh, markers that might indicate um, kind of early warning issues, and um, there's 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 various other potential m m metabolites and uh, uh, areas there that will come to the fore, and it'd be great to have an easily measured biomarker or biomarkers that can indicate when mental health is declining and improving and start to analyze data sets so that you can optimize. That's something that we want to do ultimately at MetSci is build essentially a mental health real-time early warning system and optimizer. And what would that look like? Well, what we plan to do is 
find people with ADHD who want to uh, test this where they wear a continuous glucose monitor. So it would be like Levels or Zoe in the UK, but for mental health. And they wear an Oura ring. And that means that you're getting glucose, glucose variability data, uh, heart rate variability, sleep quality. And they will put in their mood and cognition into our platform and we'll be able to see is there a causal correlation here between gradients in any of these measurements and we think we're going to find them and we think we're going to be able to say to people stop what you're doing you're on a downward curve or keep doing what you're doing you're moving in the right direction based on your past data history and the population data so we're quite ambitious about that but that's where we want MedSci to be in the next five years. That's amazing. Um, Ali, one of the things that I am very passionate about is accessibility, right? And we know that accessibility allows people to have access to, you know, a lot of wearables, to get supplements, to get a very high quality diet, et cetera, et cetera. What do you advise for people who are not in that position? How can they get started and what can they do to try to see if they see an improvement with this methodology? Yes, that's a good question because, you know, accessibility means all sorts of different things, doesn't it? It can come in all sorts of forms and there's no one right answer. I think working with clients who initially think there's going to be a financial barrier or a skills barrier or a movement barrier to doing a ketogenic or particularly a carnivore diet actually turns out to be um, not true. You know, they realized that they were spending money on on things that they no longer eat or that they were spending time preparing it. We're actually preparing meat sometimes is much easier and quicker and um, doesn't require as much energy. Now, obviously at the, the lower end of the scale where people can barely move out of bed or think straight for five minutes, then it's a trickier question. And sometimes I think having um, friends and family that can help is important. And I think that's something that we've looked at with MetSci in the future. How do we build in accessibility? And I think having a, a system that other people can monitor for you on your behalf could be a really powerful thing. Now, I know that that seems like a bit of a fudge to the question, but I also think that in communities like the MECFS community and any chronic illness community, mental health is is no different that there's a an understandable callous built up in terms of compassion to new ideas because you just feel like you've tried everything mm -hmm. and it's not worked and anytime something else comes along you think oh here, here we go another snake oil salesman it, quackery it's just trying to get my money i'm vulnerable and i get it but i think there's a perception that maybe ketogenic diets and um, other lifestyle interventions have this big barrier to them. I just don't think that's true in practice, in my experience, except at the end of things where people are so poor that they can only afford to boil pasta in their kettle or whatever. And I, and I, I know that people are in that situation and it's difficult. So there's no public funding anywhere that I'm aware of for this kind of thing, although I think it will eventually come. And that certain diagnoses will bring with um, uh, the ability to get prescription food. And um, I want to see more of that if the prescription food is good. But, you know, it's it, it's easier than most people think. And I think the, your, the second part of your question from before is, is important here too, around other things you can do beyond just food and how other lifestyle interventions interact with metabolism and i think there are things that people can do even with low accessibility so light is a huge thing i believe in this because the disconnect between our modern and ancestral environments is you know a lot of that is light we're indoors we're not under the sun like we used to be um yes we probably sought shade and had shelters going back a long way in human evolution but we, of course, would have got a lot of sunlight and 
that means exposure all throughout the day um, and the spectrum changes throughout the day from, you know, more uh, uh, just peak in the green um, in the middle of the day and uh, more infrared um, in the morning and evening. And the blue light fades, but now we have blue light from our screens, from our bulbs, and you know, you've seen these graphs of melatonin, the sleep hormone, does other things, of course, but it absolutely tanks with any blue light. So I think even people who have very low energy reserves can start to affect their light environments. They can wear blue blocking glasses. They can, um, in the evening, I mean, they can um, try to op even open their window to get natural sunlight. Um, they can wear cheap infrared that uh, LED clasps or lamps. You do not need to spend a lot of money on a fancy infrared sauna. You can literally get a lamp for 30 bucks and it, it does the job. And there's some fascinating stuff on how um, just exposure to infrared light on the back will improve glucose metabolism the next day. And people are trying to work out why, but I think it's because of the way water is in the body that you structure the water the brilliant book called The Fourth Phase of Water by Jared Pollack about this. And I don't see another explanation of why uh, peripheral infrared illumination results in systemic uh, better glucose control. Um, so I think UV light is misunderstood and is vital for our human health. In the UK where I am and lots of Northern Europe, there isn't any UV light between you know, October and March. There's just none, even in the midday sun. And so what people used to do was have cod liver oil during the winter and, um, you know, do cold water bathing and stuff like that to uh, try to um, shore up the, the, the problems with uh, not having direct access to UV. They, um, they would also probably put on a little bit of weight at the end of summer and into autumn and if you're also getting the sunlight, then you would store vitamin D in your fat. And so you would use it over the winter as well and have access to it. But I think it's perfectly understandable why um, people with psoriasis get prescribed UV light mm -hmm. and why I've heard clients of mine say, when I go on a sunbed, I feel amazing, but I just don't want to get cancer. And I get it. It's ionizing radiation and there is a risk. But I think it's a U-shaped curve. I think it's really good for you in the right amount. And then it can be really bad for you if you have too much. Mm -hmm. I never would never advocate burning in UV light. And I would always advocate limiting non-ancestral foods to try to limit the amount of oxidative damage going on in the skin that can um, help UV light turn into something more serious. But I think getting the right light at the right time is almost as important as diet and um, um, that if you can do the things I said then it's cheap it's not free but it, it should be accessible to most people yeah wonderful what entry level resources um, would you um, advise people to get for people who want to read more and, and do their own research in this uh, field well a great place to start uh, I would say this is metsy.com, M-E-T-P-S-Y.com, because we have deliberately put the information there. So um, there's a free membership you can join and look at the forum, and uh, there's a lot of information there for free. And um, there is uh, my podcast, Ali Houston Transforms podcast. I've interviewed lots of people, including Tess Fehler and many others on a wide variety of topics. Um, including lots about metabolic psychiatry. So Jan Bazuki's been on, um, Ian Campbell, researcher from Edinburgh University on bipolar disorder, the great Dr. Georgia Eid, Dr. Chris Palmer, the list goes on and on. Um, they're all really good resources. And we also have a very affordable monthly membership. So um, it's it's going the price is going up, but only a little bit to $19. And that, for that, you get a, an expert Q&A every month and uh, videos with experts and uh, monthly journal and book club where we dissect 
some of the latest research or a really interesting book to do with metabolic psychiatry. So I think getting this information is enough for some people. You know, it was enough for me. I ran with it and ended up changing my career because it was so successful. For other people, I think they need a bit of help, support and accountability. And that's what we try to do at MetSci. And um, I think once you get there, you realize as well that we're not shy about sharing other resources that are, you know, specialized in, in particular areas. Wonderful. Are you working with clients directly as well? If anybody was interested in working with you? Yes, absolutely. So I do think it's important to have a low cost option um, so that people find it accessible. But I also do some one to one work. Uh, I'm very busy, so I'm not always available, but I do have space for one to one work as well. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Ali, thank you so much for your time today. This has been very informative. Um, anything else that you would like the audience to know before we go? Yes. Um, so it's been a great chat. I really appreciate you having me on. And um, besides people who might be interested in metabolic psychiatry for themselves or for others, we're also running this study in Oxford for ADHD with depression. And we're, we're crowdfunding for it. So it would be amazing if this is a subject which kind of touches you personally um, or, you know, in your family or anyone you work with and care about and you want to see this research getting done, then you can contribute. And if you, if you don't mind, I'll share the, the link. Absolutely. Uh, it's bit.ly, that's B-I-T dot L-Y slash A-D-H-D keto. And as I say, any donation, pounds, euros, dollars that you give will be matched by Bazooki Foundation. So you'll double your money essentially, which is amazing. Very generous of them. And um, I really appreciate any any anything that people can give. That's wonderful. And everybody is always asking where's the research on that, right? So that's a great way to support the research and uh, then look at the findings so we can know what subset of people, you know, this works best for. Um, and which subset of people it doesn't and why. That's the importance of furthering research, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Ali, for being on the Ancestral Health Today podcast. We thank you and um, looking forward to sharing this with our audience. Thanks as well. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Ancestral Health Today. We hope you enjoyed our discussion on how evolutionary insights can inform modern health practices. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast to catch future episodes.